Okay, lecture 11.5, Boda plots. So, given equation 11.37, which is the boxed equation from the end of last lecture, where we did that whole derivation, we got to the end, we were like, oh, I mean, I know it was a little, we didn't have a box because it was on the balcony and whatever, outside class, but, but um, we got to this equation here where we had the input amplitude scaled by the magnitude of the frequency response function at the frequency of the input sinusoid, multiplying a sinusoid at the input sinusoid's frequency. And then we had the original phase shift plus the phase contribution from the frequency response function evaluated at the frequency of the input sinusoid as well. Okay, so that was our the big result that we got last time. And Given that result, uh, we are often most interested in the magnitude and phase of the frequency response function. Those are the two forms in which it arises in that equation, right? So the, the magnitude and the phase are the, two, are the two objects. So that's what we are most interested to find. Each of these is a function of angular frequency omega. So plotting the magnitude versus the frequency and the phase versus the frequency is quite useful. That's exactly what boda plots are. That's what a boda plot is, such a plot with axes scaled in a specific manner. And that's actually the whole thing. So boda plots, kind of a big topic, kind of a, uh, well, definitely going to show up on the exam, kind of a major thing that we learn about here, important concept. Uh, but really, it's just a, they're just a graphical representation of the frequency response function. Um, it's like not that radical of a concept, really. But the usefulness of them, they're actually quite useful. So um, this lecture is kind of long. It's going to be in two parts. And we'll, we'll learn um, about these in detail. So before we kind of get into the, into the weeds on this, I did want to mention that, so MATLAB has a function, BODA. We'll take a look at it next time. And it's, it's great. You just give it a transfer function, and bang, it gives you the BODA plot. Um, it's beautiful. So back in the day, boda plots were something that you couldn't necessarily get MATLAB to do because MATLAB didn't exist. So they had to plot them by hand, okay? And so that was good times. Um, and plotting them by hand, uh, there's a technique that was evolved that you would think would be obsolete now. So we don't really need to learn it anymore, right? We don't need to really need to learn how to sketch a boda plot by hand. However, uh, that proves to be incorrect. Um, and the reason for that is it's true. I mean, getting a boda plot using MATLAB is trivially easy. So like for that part of it, it's not, it's not that helpful. But when you're designing a system and you have a boda plot that looks a certain way, and as we'll come to understand more and more, the shape of that boda plot really affects the performance of the system. Okay, so you have a boda plot, maybe you've analyzed your system as it's given, uh, and you're going to do some design, you want to maybe, maybe alter that system somehow. Um, if you don't understand how the, the uh, building blocks of the frequency response function or the transfer function affect the boda plot, you're you're kind of just like stabbing around in the dark trying to design something like should you make this heavier should you make this spring stiffer should you increase the gain on this feedback loop or should you decrease the gain um, you don't really know and you're just sort of uh, you, all you can do is just guess and then just like have MATLAB plot it again and like maybe it looks better maybe it looks worse you just have no idea um, so in order to do design it's very helpful to have these, these sketching techniques understood. 
um, even if you, you're not like awesome at doing the actual sketches, understanding how each of these these uh, elementary building blocks that go into sketching a Boto plot um, is still a very useful skill. And this is going to come back again in a couple weeks when we're doing controls. There are some other graphical techniques that, once again, MATLAB can make the plot for you, but if you don't understand how the plot changes when you change parameters, you can't design with it very well. You can analyze with it just fine, but when you do design, you can't, you can't, you, you can't say, oh, well, clearly we need to adjust this parameter this way. That wouldn't be something that you'd be able to come up with. So that's why, that's why understanding the graphical techniques, understanding these, these building block concepts um, is still very much relevant and useful. And it's not just like an old technique that MATLAB can do easily. So. I, I harp on certain things like this because uh, when I was an undergrad, I remember being very, very perplexed by this type of thing. Like, we have computers that do all these techniques now. Why do we need to learn all these hand stuff? Like, why is that even useful anymore? Um, and it mostly comes down to design is the answer. And for analysis, it's usually not that important to be able to do it. But for, for design, it is. Okay, so a Boda plot is a useful graphical representation of the frequency response of a system. Let the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the input and the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the output be the complex amplitudes of the input and output respectively. Recall that the magnitude of the frequency response function H can be expressed as, so we, we know from the definition that H of J omega is equal to the fraction of the output Fourier transform over the input Fourier transform, right? So if you take the magnitude of this, you take the magnitude of the other side, which simplifies down to the magnitude of the numerator over the magnitude of the denominator. So that's our magnitude of our frequency response function. This is a ratio of amplitudes. And so it is akin to amplitude ratios commonly expressed in decibels, okay, dB. Now dB is something that you guys have probably encountered before. Typically when you find decibel units, you've taken a fraction or a ratio of two quantities with the same units. So you've come up with a dimensionless ratio, right? Like you had meters over meters, volts over volts, something like that. Decibels um, technically require that you have this dimensionless ratio. However, uh, the ratio in this expression is in general not dimensionless. Your, output, your, your, your input could be in units volts and your output could, output could be in units radians per second. So this ratio isn't necessarily going to have um, uh, a unitless um, dimension to it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to just like ignore that. This is just the standard way of doing this. Just ignore that. Still put it into the decibels equation and interpret the result as not being necessarily dimensionless like like the uh, typical dB is considered to be. So uh, it's the standard usage, and so we call it dB, but like we kind of know it's like it air quotes dB. Um, and the standard dB uh, formula, we just plug it right in. So H of J omega, the magnitude of it in dB is equal to 20 log base 10 of the frequency response function, h of, or the magnitude of the frequency response function, h of, h of j omega. And this is in decibels. So this is how we plot the magnitude in the Boda plot, is in this weird db thing, okay? And we'll see like a lot of examples of this, so 
don't have to don't have to worry too much about it. Um, but but essentially what we do is we take this this magnitude of the frequency response function. I just plug it into this formula, right? 20 log base 10 of whatever it is, and then we plot that point. The phase is usually plotted in degrees. Can be done in radians, but it's most common to see it in degrees. Uh, and the omega axis, which is the horizontal axis, is logarithmic in both plots. The two plots are typically tiled vertically with the magnitude plot above the phase plot. So we're going to do a simple example now. So this is, the, the Boda plot is like, it's just a plot of the frequency response function, but it's like this very specific version of it, right? So that's what we're specking out here, is how to do that specific version. And that's uh, what we do in a simple example to start. Um, so let a system have this transfer function S, which is a single zero at the origin. Okay, so H of S equals S. Pretty simple transfer function. It's called a differentiator, in case you're keeping score at home. Uh, so find the frequency response function and draw the Boda plot for the system. So this is just, we're essentially using the definition just as a blunt instrument to say, oh, okay, here's a transfer function. We know how to find the frequency response function from the transfer function. Let's do that. Let's plot the magnitude and phase of that function. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Later, we're going to learn this sort of building blocks technique, okay? But we're going to start with this, this process, just straightforward from the definition. So to find the frequency response function from the transfer function, we can just use the really nice formula that we saw a couple lectures ago, which is that we can take the transfer function and evaluate it at s equals j omega to get out our frequency response function. In this case, the transfer function is just s evaluated at s equals j omega, which is just j omega. Super complicated example I chose. But I just want, I want to mention that. Cause, so like we have, I, I do a lot of simple examples in the class because long examples, like complicated examples, just take way more time to go through. And what you take time doing is just like the algebra or the arithmetic, right? It's just, it's not stuff that's hard necessarily, it's just tedious. So I skip that stuff by doing a simple example. But we're going to go through all the steps required to do any complexity example here, just that the intermediate calculations take longer, just so we don't get lost in the weeds. We want to get, stay focused on what we're doing. So this is, uh, this is our h of j omega. Um, and then we want to know what the magnitude is. Um, actually, before we do the magnitude, let's do a little sketch of the complex plane. And let's see what this looks like in the complex plane. Well, it's always purely imaginary, right? Because omega, let's assume, is a real number. Assume omega is positive for a minute. It's going to be on the imaginary axis somewhere at, like, height omega, right? So when we find its magnitude, what do you guys think it should be? Just like before we even do the calculation. We'll do the calculation, but what's the, what's the length of that? Well, uh, it's omega, right? So yeah, so it's just omega. And then the, what's the phase going to be? The phase is this angle, right? 90 degrees. Or if omega is negative, it'll be it would be uh, uh, 270, but we're going to take positive omega. Yeah. Okay, so that's like, uh, so we're, we're making progress here, right? We're already, like, we already see the magnitude of phase. It doesn't always come out this easily, but like, just to like get a little feel for it early, we can, 
we can do that. It's good to keep that complex plane in mind when you're doing these calculations. So the magnitude calculation, uh, let's, let's write out the general formula. If you want to find the magnitude of the frequency response function, then by Pythagorean theorem, so that's just the length of this, it's going to be the square root of the real part of h of j omega squared plus the imaginary part of h of j omega squared. And we take the square root of that entire thing of the sum. And in this case, what's the real part of h of j omega? Zero. Zero squared. There's no real part. It's purely imaginary. And what's the imaginary part? Omega. Great. So this is just equal to omega assuming uh, omega is greater than zero. Okay. We'll take just omega greater than zero. Yeah. Uh, so imaginary, so I am, yeah, and then it's just open parenthesis, closed parenthesis, um, yeah, and then the phase, which we already know is 90, but we want to be able to do this in general, right, because I'm not always going to give you an easy one. You're going to run into ones that are going to be harder, not just in this class, but IRL, right? Yeah, IRL. I know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure out. Oh yeah, I know. I know. In real life, I know. I don't even know anymore. LOL. Just like say that instead of laughing now? Is that what you do? I don't know. So you take the arctangent of the imaginary part of h of j omega over the real part. Whoa. Over the real part of h of j omega. The imaginary part is omega. The real part is zero, and the arctan, as you go off to infinity with the argument, goes to 90 degrees, or DEG is the preferred notation now. So that's our phase, magnitude and phase. Great. Uh, we're ready to plot now, right? So we've got the frequency response function, we've got the magnitude, we've got the phase. Oh, we didn't do uh, dB magnitude, so I should probably... do that. All you do is you just plug whatever the magnitude is into the formula, right? So magnitude of h of j omega is equal to 20 log base 10 of h, magnitude of h of j omega, which is just omega in dB. Cool. So that's now we just need to plot magnitude and dB, phase and degrees for all frequency. But we're gonna take we're gonna take it like a little bit slow here. Uh, so when I give you guys a problem on an exam, I usually give you guys like a blank axes because axes are a little bit tough to construct. But in your homework, uh, I would encourage you to just go ahead and, and sketch that out on paper yourself. Like sketch your own on some graph paper, or engineering pad paper. Um, but let's make a couple axes here, however you want to do that. And we're going to plot on the upper one the magnitude 
of h of j omega in uh, db. And on this one, we're going to plot the phase of h of j omega in degrees. Okay, the uh, horizontal axis on both of these is going to be omega, the angular frequency. Okay. Um, Let's do, so we can do it over all omega. Remember, we have to do this logarithmic scale in omega. Um, let's have them both be omega here, so that both horizontal axes are omega. So I'm going to do um, omega equals 1 here, so 10 to the 0. And then I'm going to do uh, halfway over here I'll do 10 to the 1 and then here will be 10 to the 2 halfway will be 10 to the minus 1 and then 10 to the minus 2 and then that'll be the same up here and yeah so that's what we've got for our Angular frequency. Oh, this should be in radians per second. Radians per second. And then uh, for decibels, let's let's do um, zero dB in the middle. Zero negative twenty. Negative forty. Twenty. Forty. And then with degrees, let's go uh, from here from zero degrees up to like 180 degrees. Okay. I chose the vertical ones based on I, I knew kind of like how big these are going to be. But, so you can do these plots different ways. Um, you're just plotting something. So the magnitude one is we got to plot we got to plot this so I, one of the ways to go about this is to just like pick a couple points to get ourselves like a little bit more comfortable so we choose omega equals one which is the very center of our plot right omega equals one we take log base 10 of one which is what zero zero log base 10 of one is zero and so we have zero times 20 is zero so zero db And if you went to uh, 10 to the 1, log base 10 of 10 to the 1 is 1. So we have 20. And then uh, 10 to the minus 1 is negative 1. So we have negative 20. And if you went to 10 to the minus 2, you would get negative 2, so negative 40 positive 40. This ends up just being linear, okay? It's just a straight line. And so we can just plot, I guess I should maybe change the color to be something that's easier to see. But we can just draw a straight line and see how poorly I got my dots on there. Um, like that. So there is our uh, magnitude plot. Pretty easy, right? And then our phase plot is just 90 degrees, constant, right? For all frequencies. The omega dropped out. It's just always going to be 90 degrees. So we just go to 90 degrees and bang. Easy. Okay, so that's our that's our just like basic example doing a Boda plot. Okay. Um, notice that these came out to be straight lines. I mean, that's they're perfectly straight lines. Uh, we're going to use that observation a little bit. So, 
It turns out that when plotted on this logarithmic scale, both the magnitude and phase are quite asymptotic to straight lines for first and second order systems, okay? So this is something beyond what we've explored so far, but this turns out to be the case. For first and second order systems, um, these plots end up being approximately straight lines. So these ones were exactly straight lines, but the ones that we'll see in a few minutes are going to be approximately straight lines. So uh, that's a useful thing. So we're going to like build up our technique for hand sketching these things. Okay, so straight lines are relatively easy to sketch. We like that. Okay, uh, great. Another, so there's like, a, so like this chain of reasoning that we're going to go through here. So the next link in it is that higher order system transfer functions can be rewritten as the product of those first and second order transfer functions, okay? So for instance, if you have some transfer function like this, which is third order, right? Then you can break this down so that we've got some constant out here. We take this numerator, and that's like a little uh, first order system. We can turn it into a single first order transfer function, like separate it out by itself. We can factor out a first order, or maybe two first order um, uh, terms from the denominator. So I did one here, and we're left with a second order remaining. So we, have a, we can rewrite this as the product of first and second order systems. And you can always do this, it turns out. So you can always rewrite your higher order transfer function as a product of first and second order transfer functions. Okay. Now, next link. Recall from, for instance, phasor representation that for products of complex numbers, phases add and magnitudes multiply. For instance, so what we did here was we said, uh, here is a little transfer function by itself. We can rewrite it as a magnitude and a phase. And so here. And then this one, we can rewrite as a magnitude and a phase. We're going to take the, the numerator version of that, or the denominator version of that, because that one's in the denominator. And then for this third one, you've got a magnitude and a phase as well. So if you want to combine these magnitudes and phases in polar terms, then you just have the product of the magnitudes and the sum of the phases, right? So product of magnitude, sum of phases. You can use the phasor angle notation, or you can use the exponential notation. Either one is totally fine. But just remember, when you use this notation, that you have to sum the phases and multiply the the uh, magnitudes. Okay. If one takes the logarithm of the magnitudes, they add. Okay. So the, the magnitudes multiply here, but when you take a logarithm of a product, remember you get a sum of logarithms. That's one of the log properties. It's actually one of the key log properties, one of the properties that make logarithms useful for this type of analysis. So that's key. So, you, you so now you're getting sums of both phases and magnitudes if you're going to look at it in, log, in the log space. Okay. There's only one more link in the chain. First and second order Boda plots depend on a handful of parameters that can be found directly from transfer functions. Okay. There's no need, therefore, to compute the magnitude and phase of the frequency response function. So we don't need to actually do that. Uh, so these should not have subscripts there. So we don't have to compute the magnitude and the phase. We can, we can just look at the first and second order transfer functions broken down like this. Use them as building blocks to construct higher order Boda plots, okay? So this sum, we're going to do this with this summation technique. And so I'll, I'll walk us through how to do that, but we need to get the building blocks first. So I'm trying to motivate this by saying, let's do first and second order Boda plot uh, uh,
building blocks. And then, given the fact that you can rewrite higher order ones in terms of those first and second order ones, let's do each building block separately, and then we can sum the results graphically. Okay, and that's what we're going to learn how to do. So the, this lecture, in the end, so the end of next part, the next part of the lecture, which will be next Monday, um, we'll learn how to do that graphical addition. But we need the building blocks first. So let's let's build up our building blocks. So w some of the few things that are like actually worth memorizing in this class are are these building block Boda plots. Okay, uh, these are going to be how you can later recognize um, how to design a system with a Boda plot that looks a certain shape. Okay. I don't tell you guys to memorize very much, but this is, this is one of the few things. Okay. All right, so Boda plots for simple transfer functions, specifically first and second order, but also uh, this first one is actually zero with order technically. Uh, so for a transfer function that is simply a constant real gain, so the transfer function h of s is equal to k, some constant. The frequency response function is just k, OK? If you plug in j omega wherever you see an s here, but there is no s, so it's just k. Its magnitude is just the magnitude of k. For positive gain k, the phase is 0. For negative gain k, the phase is 180 degrees. So that's a pretty simple Boda plot frequency response function. I didn't even plot this one because it's just both of them are just constants. So I didn't even bother plotting them. Let's look at the pull and zero at the origin. So we looked at a zero at the origin, which is h of s equals s. So that is this one. Sorry, I don't know what happened to the the sub figure. Um, formatting just got weird, the, the captions. But uh, the magnitude plot, this was the plot that we came up with, right? This has a slope of 20 decibels per decade. A decade is a factor of 10 in frequency. And uh, in uh, degrees, the phase in degrees is 90 degrees. So that was the one that we came up with, right? We went through that process. The, uh, the transfer function that's just the reciprocal of that, so the single pole at the origin, has a slope of negative 20 dB per decade. And it goes through frequency of 1, right, at 0 dB. OK, and then the phase is negative 90 degrees. So that's like, it's just like sort of the opposite of the single uh, 0 at the origin. OK, let's do the real pull and real zero. So I, there's not a uh, derivation. I'm not providing a derivation for this, but I'll just provide the plots. So let's look at that. So let's first, let's look at the uh, pole, a real pole that's not at the origin here. So we've got this. This is as the transfer function. And let's draw, so one of the things we're going to look at here is how do we draw straight line approximations of this? So this one is 0 dB for all these low end frequencies up until we get to this point, which is 10 to the 0 or 1. But notice that my axis here is, is actually dimensionless here. So it's normalized angular frequency tau omega. So that, that happens, this knee in the curve, this has straight line too, uh, but this, this bend in it happens when tau omega equals 1, right? So the frequency at which that happens is 1 over tau, 
And we call this, and this is a very important term, the break frequency. The break frequency. So that corresponds to this point here. And after that, it is once again a straight line. And it goes off at a slope of negative 20 dB per decade. So you can tell, you can start here and you say, okay, at 20 or in one decade, so you go from 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 1. In one decade, I went 20 dB down. And then the next decade, you go another 20 dB down. So that's your slope of that line. Okay, so you know, you know how to do this straight line. You know how to do this straight line. The only thing that you can do to refine your straight line plot is to recognize that this offset here, so there's that little gap where that at the break frequency, right? And that gap is, is about 3 dB. So 3 decibels at the break frequency. So when you go, you draw your straight line approximation and then you can go back and you can give it a little round there at 3 dB. That's a nice way to refine your, your, your uh, sketch to make it a little bit better. Okay, the phase is going to be similarly starting out at 0. So it starts out at 0 and then the straight line approximation really kind of breaks down at about one, one decade below the break frequency. This is the break frequency, right? All the way up. Oh no. Don't die. Uh, and then we have a slope. Uh, so if we're going to come up with a new straight line approximation, we have to go from a decade below the break frequency to a decade above the break frequency at this, uh, with this straight line. The straight line is going to go down 90 degrees. We drop 90 degrees. Um, and uh, we go through this point. We go through this point here of negative 45 degrees at the break frequency. So that's our straight line approximation is that from one decade below, so one decade to one decade above, we drop 90 degrees with this straight line slope. It's not perfect, but it's a reasonable approximation. And then we say f after that, we go back to leveling it out at negative 90 degrees. So that's again our straight line sketch. Okay, so the same thing applies for a real zero. So a real zero does essentially the same thing. It goes up to the break frequency. And this time, instead of going negative 20 dB per decade, it goes positive 20 dB per decade. And so our slope here is 20 dB per decade. And we start out again at zero phase to a decade below the break frequency. And then we go to a decade above the break frequency. Instead of going down negative 90, we go up to positive 90 this time. And then we level out to zero or to, to 90 degrees again. So no slope thereafter. So those are our, our straight line approximations. And they, they work pretty well. So we've started, we've, we've got the zeroth order, which is just the gain. We've got the pole and the zero at the origin. And now we've got the real pole, real zero. Now the only thing that's left is going to be the second order, um, uh, the complex conjugate pairs of, uh, uh, of poles and zeros. So we're going to talk about those when we come back next time. 
um, we want to be able to go up to that point because that's the last thing that will, that will be a basic building block. And then we're going to be able to do any, any Boda plot sketch just from the transfer function. Okay? So it's a, it's a pretty useful skill to get used to. And this definitely definitely be on the exam. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So any questions on that? Okay. All right. See you guys Monday.